So welcome to this uh, one hour webinar organized by the funded project Nudge. I am Marine from IECP. We are uh, as IECP project coordinators and communications lead of, uh, of the project. Today, uh, Nudge will be introduced by my colleague Filippos Anagnostopoulos, who is coordinator of Nudge. While the survey results and analysis behind our energy consumer profiling will be presented by Peter Conradier and Mercuris Karaliopoulos, respectively senior researchers at IMEC and uh, the Athens University of Economics and Business. If you have questions during the presentations, you can uh, just type them into the chat. I will gather them and we will answer them all at the end. We have around 15 minutes blocked uh, for that. Uh, please also note that as stated in the registration form, this event is being recorded uh, so that we can share the recording with those who couldn't attend today. This webinar builds on the results of the first nudge activities and especially as mentioned, uh, the European wide online survey that uh, was made available in 15 languages and completed by people from 29 countries. It broke fresh ground in the study of energy related behavior by operationalizing free the theoretical models. The results were used to profile energy consumers and understand their behavior in relation to energy efficiency. I will let the floor now to Filippos, Peter and Mercuris, and I will see you at the end of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Marine. Welcome everyone, from myself as well. Um, as you heard today, we are presenting uh, one of our, let's say, landmark reports on profiling energy consumers. Uh, indeed, it has built on a, on a very long survey and some very thorough analysis. So Peter and Mercuris will delve into the report a bit further, and now I'll just present to you uh, the overall position of the project so you also understand how this uh, very good work fits within the wider framework. So the Nudge project has uh, these 11 partners. It's mostly research institutes and, uh, and SMEs. Um, it's a project that started a year ago and it has two more years to, to proceed. And essentially what, uh, what we do is that we look at behavioral interventions to promote energy efficiency and we want to see how we can generalize their use to be an addition to the policy making toolbox. A bit of a discussion on nudging. So nudging, I mean, this is the official definition by Thaler and Sunstein, who also won the Nobel on economics. Um, uh, another way to put it is that nudging motivates behavior without resulting to uh, either monetary or in-kind incentives. And there are many different types of nudges. So a simple one is to have a, a preset, uh, a default option in your, your device settings, for example. There are social influence nudges where there's comparison with peers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a very interesting field. It has received a lot of attention over the past 10 years, and we have decided to see what is its application for promoting energy efficiency. Our objectives is to design these interventions tailored to psychological uh, variables and to do this by being supported through data analytics. Uh, we will be executing field trials. These pilots where we will be testing uh, these behavior based interventions along with more traditional interventions. And our scope here is to have a, a robust and systematic research protocol that will measure the impacts and the effectiveness of these nudging interventions. And finally, to consolidate these findings into recommendations for policymakers. So following this line, this is a very simple schematic of what we intend to do, or actually what we have started doing. Um, on the left side of the pilots, there's the preparatory phase where we have the survey, to have uh, user profiling, and we also design behavioral interventions. Then these are tested in our five pilots, which will be presented in, uh, in a few slides. Uh, we get our results from these interventions, we have their analysis, and we end up with uh, some very robust policy recommendations. So in this pre-pilot phase, 
we have done the, the survey profile. We are being, we're designing the interventions and at the same time we have been installing mainly smart meters, thermostats, indoor air quality meters and so on. We've been building the digital interfaces, so mostly dashboards and mobile apps that allow users to monitor their energy behavior and manage it. And we have also built a central data platform which collects all this data for the further analysis. What is being presented today is, first of all, the profile survey, in which we have asked uh, simple questions around energy saving behavior. For example, do you turn off the heating when you live in the house? And this survey has been based on three theories, the theory of plant behavior, the value belief norm theory, and the prototype willingness model. And we have also control for gender, countries, incomes, age, education, and so on. Uh, Peter will present this in further detail very soon. As an outcome, uh, we have six profiles of energy consumers, uh, and it's quite interesting to, to delve into the details of how this has come about. Mercurius will present those uh, in, uh, towards the end of today's webinar. What comes next? is that we have uh, randomized control trials in our pilots where we'll be testing those various interventions, uh, monitoring the responses, comparing findings, evaluating what has worked, what is not. And as mentioned, our end result is the, the recommendations of how to use nudging in policy making. And finally, I want to present to you uh, a very brief overview of our five pilots in Croatia, Portugal, Greece, Belgium, Germany. Uh, they, they are intergenerational. We, we have uh, uh, not only electricity, but also natural gas, and we also examine health and comfort aspects. We have energy communities, we have uh, residential, we have schools. Um, we look at PV, and uh, self-consumption and electric vehicles in that respect. So they, they are well-rounded trying to capture as many uh, aspects of uh, energy consumption as possible, mostly on the residential level. What they all have in common is that a, they aim to motivate long-term energy efficiency and behavior change potential. Uh, they all have these digital user interfaces being either uh, a dashboard or an app and they allow users to monitor and manage their energy use. All of these are quite advanced and they will be starting uh, promoting and testing actually the nudges only in, uh, within, at the end of this year and early next. So this has been a very brief overview of, uh, of the nudge project and I'll hand over to Peter the moment. Peter, please feel free to take control. Thank you very much, uh, Philippos. Thank you very much, uh, Marin, for the uh, introduction. So today you will hear from mostly me and uh, colleague Mercuris, but we'll also like to thank all the other colleagues from AUEB, from Fraunhofer, also from ACN, who participated in, uh, in the development of the survey and the recruitment of, uh, of participants. So as Philippos mentioned, uh, the NUT survey forms the base uh, for us to explore uh, further behavior. Uh, so before I go into some of the, of the details of the results, um, I'd like to quickly go through the, the setup of the survey. So broadly, we focus on five uh, modules. First of all, starting with the general information of, of the dwelling. So looking at energy efficiency or production of energy. This was followed by a series of questions that relate to actual energy saving behavior. The third module comprises uh, the majority of the work and these were 15 attitudinal, motivational and behavioral constructs uh, that uh, measure um, uh, or that, that are operationalize the theoretical models. So I will uh, also go into a little bit more detail and Mercury will discuss them as well. And the fourth module explored uh, some of the uh, energy platforms and real-time energy monitoring. And finally, we end up with some socio-demographic variables, including uh, educational levels um, and, uh, and income. So 
method, we followed a fairly uh, standard uh, survey methodology. Um, so our total sample comprised 3,129 persons. Uh, after data cleaning, uh, um, this was the, we re had to remove some miners and people not located in Europe. And uh, the majority of our survey uh, was sampled through our uh, partner ACN, but we also were lucky enough to, to have a Flemish panel of 1,042 uh, participants in uh, Flanders. So when we look at the, the makeup of the, of the participants geographically, we see here that for Northern Europe and Eastern Europe, the sample is comparatively small. Uh, so Northern Europeans comprise most significantly out of Latvian, um, uh, Latvian participants, whereas Southern Europe is a bit more spread out. We have a very large uh, contingent of Italians and, and Greeks. And then finally, uh, Western Europe is mostly comprising of uh, Flemish participants here in Belgium, um, and it also comprises the largest part of our survey. Then when we look at the gender, we have a very fairly good gender balance, 51% uh, male, 48,5% female. And then we also uh, provided the option for participants to indicate if they have identified as uh, neither male nor female. Uh, of this is 0.5% uh, uh, or uh, 16 participants in our sample. I will delve into this a little bit more deeper in a few minutes. Uh, then the first really interesting results that we have looks at the saving behaviors in four usage domains. So we look at heating and cooling, water, kitchen, and general appliances. So first here we can clearly see that, that we have a very large contingent of, of people that do not have air conditioning. Uh, so the first behavior that jumps out is turning off the heating while the air conditioning is on. Uh, very few people uh, uh, can perform this behavior, so it's not really applicable. Whereas uh, turning the heating off when absent seems to be quite popular, along with keeping the doors open and closed in certain areas or closing the curtains and uh, the blinds to prevent heat uh, loss or gain during the winter or summer. Then when we move towards uh, the kitchen, we see very strong preference of shower over bathing. But then another interesting result here is that uh, even though people profess to prefer a shower over taking a bath, they are less willing, or, or we see here in the data, that they are not so uh, willing to, to shower to shower less. Uh, another um, common behavior here is turning off the tap. Um, and we also see here the reducing of the hot water temperature settings in the thermostat is not uh, as, uh, as common, uh, possibly because of uh, people not having this, uh, this ability. And secondly, because it's uh, a little bit uh, too complex for many of the participants. Then in the kitchen, cooking with the pots covered, quite uh, quite common. Uh, we see the absence of, of the dishwasher also in the, in the results. And of course, um, uh, the, if you do not have a dishwasher, you are also not able to, to use the echo mode. So this is also reflected uh, in, the, in the data. Um, finally, looking at some of the general appliances, also quite, uh, quite interesting to see here that we have uh, very few people who have uh, PV installations. Um, and this is also reflected here where we see uh, the PV um, using the electric vehicle when PV is high. Uh, not many people in our sample uh, own both a, a photovoltaic installation and a, uh, an electric vehicle. Very common behavior as one might expect here is turning the lights off when, when leaving the room. And then finally, um, what I was quite uh, intrigued by and surprised uh, is to see here the extent uh, to which people are interested in having more information about their consumption levels. We see here that there's quite a quite a strong interest. Uh, there's very few people in our sample comparatively who profess that they have no interest at all to see their uh, data consumption. Uh, and of these, the use of major appliances um, uh, is, uh, is, is quite uh, quite popular. Uh, average monthly use as well, as one might expect. Uh, and also interest here is the active occupancy. Comparatively, less people are interested in, in seeing this information. So that gives a bit of a of an overview of saving behavior and the setup of the survey. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about now is going a little bit more into detail. So uh, one of the goals here was to, to look at the intention to reduce heating related 
consumption. So what we did here was we generated a, uh, a uh, theoretical model that comprises of three general, of three common models of, of behavior. So first of all, theory of planned behavior, which might be familiar to some of you. And in this case, uh, we, we uh, also try to explain uh, the attitude towards something. And I will discuss theory of planned behavior in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Uh, this was followed by value belief norm theory, which has been used quite uh, often in sustainable behavior and studies on sustainable behavior. And then finally, we have the prototype willingness model, which relates a little bit more to risk behavior, but we've also seen some uh, uh, studies that employed it to assess, engage uh, sustainable behavior. Uh, so we are, as far as we know, the first to combine these three models into, into one. Uh, and so when we look at specifically at theory of planned behavior, what we are trying to assess here are the, the situation of factors that influence your, your intent to perform the specific behavior. And in our case, we refer to reducing heating related consumption. So some of you might also question, so what is the relation here with nudging? So that is a sp specific and deliberate choice not to include uh, explicit questions about uh, nudging in the survey. And the reason being, Nudging is typically um, uh, uh, evaluated and explored experimentally, but nonetheless, we did uh, make a, an effort, a deliberate effort to look at some of the, uh, of, of the nudges and how they relate to our constructs. So we have, for example, the nudge loss aversion, and it's obviously very clear here that they, this type of, uh, of nudge has a link with uh, um, constructs such as financial concern and awareness of consequences. So even though nudging is not explicitly in the survey, we do have uh, have, have it sort of uh, em embedded uh, implicitly. So getting back to what I want to talk to you about today. So we have uh, limited time. Uh, so we made a decision to focus specifically on the results of our theory of planned behavior. So in and of itself, um, this is quite an interesting model uh, to look at. Personally, we think it's more interesting to, to to see it holistically, but we have a bit of a time constraint, so I will I will focus today on the subjective norm, perceived behavioral control, and uh, about attitude and its relation to to intent. And to give you a little bit more an idea of what these three things try to to measure, subjective norm relates to the uh, your direct environment and how uh, other people perceive your behavior. To give you a very clear idea, or one of the sample items we used is people who are important to me expect that I save energy by lowering the temperature setting in winter. And the hypothesis being that the more important these people are to you, the more likely you are to also exhibit this, uh, this intention. Uh, following this, we have perceived behavioral control. This relates much more to the practical side of, of performing a particular behavior. So the question or the, the item here is, I have the capabilities to save energy by lowering the temperature setting in winter. And finally, we have attitude towards particular behavior, as one might expect, um, having a positive or negative attitude towards a behavior uh, will have an uh, associated uh, impact on the intent. And for the social scientists among us, uh, the reliability of these constructs were all adequate with uh, a good Kombach, uh, Kombach Alpha. So uh, I will present you a series of regression models. So um, before I delve into the results for the theory of planned behavior, first looking at our social demographic results, we find a very slight impact of, of age. Also looking at our regions, uh, Northern European uh, participants uh, slightly uh, less likely or showing less intent, uh, Southern Europeans slightly more. These compared to the reference category of, of Eastern Europe, Whereas for educational levels, we find no effect. But I must also uh, uh, contextualize these results a little bit. You see that we have a, sub a sample of more than 3,000. So it's not very hard to get significant results uh, in such a big sample. And also when you see our R squared, which, uh, which um, denotes the, 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 the explained variance. So how much of our intent can be explained by these demographic variables? we find actually that it's quite low. So um, age, 
region or, or degree is not, in our uh, opinion, a very good predictor of your intent to reduce heating uh, related consumption. So the eagle-eyed among you might also see that we do not include gender in the model. This was a specific um, uh, deliberate decision uh, because we had 16 people who uh, gave other as their gender. We were faced with a choice of either removing these 16, 16 people or uh, not including gender because you cannot have a categorical predictor uh, with only 16 participants. So as a precaution, um, we, we had to look and see, is there any uh, effect between gender and intent? And indeed, we find that uh, there's no statistically significant effect between uh, your gender and your intent. And another uh, thing that you might have noticed is that we also have include uh, have removed income. Also here, similarly, there's no uh, intent or no association between income and intent. The, the line is essentially flat. So uh, as a precaution, we also did the analysis um, with the inclusion of gender and intent, and we, we come to broadly the same results. Uh, and another thing that we must emphasize here, we had uh, many people refusing to provide their income. Uh, so that is why we, we removed it from, from the model. But we don't think, or we find it not very likely that income, if it is, if there is an effect that it will be very strong. So then going back to our theory of planned behavior models, we ve see very nicely here in the results that the hypothesis holds true. Um, attitude, perceived behavioral control and subjective norms, all uh, positively associated with a, a significance value of below 0.001, so quite strong, uh, with uh, perceived behavioral control being by far the strongest, uh, strongest effect. Uh, then when I look at, the, uh, look at the model as a whole, we, we see slight differences in our socio-demographic variables. Uh, once again, age, very, very slight negative association. Uh, we find Southern Europe, uh, the impact has uh, decreased slightly, and Western Europe a uh, negative, slightly negative effect. Um, and also, finally, your doctoral degree. If you're a doc, if you have a doctoral degree, you seem to have a slightly less, uh, slightly less likely to have the intent. But once again, I want to be very clear. I want to emphasize here that these results are very uh, modest compared to the theory of planned behavior results, which uh, are much stronger. So attitude has uh, increased uh, slightly in the final model, perceived behavioral control decreased slightly and subjective norms also decreased slightly. And if you look uh, at the bottom, you see the adjusted R square, uh, the model as we have it right now, including only our socio-demographic variables and the adjusted uh, and the uh, theory of play behavior, we arrive at a explained variance of uh, close to 60%. Um, Looking then at our at our graphs here, uh, we, we can clearly see this, the, the, the strength of the slopes, but this should not be surprising uh, given the previous slide. Uh, behavioral control, attitude and social norms all uh, having a strong uh, association. Uh, so noteworthy takeaways before I, I hand over to my colleague uh, Mercury here is um, as a predictor, social demographic effects are present but minimal, so I, I wouldn't uh, um, place too much uh, faith in, in them as a predictor for intent. Uh, attitude, also important, uh, but both perceived behavioral control and subjective norms show much stronger effect. And I think looking at the results, um, this is quite interesting or at least quite positive, because as you can imagine, uh, changing someone's attitude is much harder than providing them with, with the the behavioral or the, the, the control, the practical means of uh, performing a behavior. Uh, so for for the coming up, uh, the coming uh, nudging experiments, I think this is uh, this is quite interesting because if if we are able to provide people with, with practical tools to support uh, their ability to reduce consumption, that uh, is uh, a lot easier than changing someone's someone's mind about whether reducing consumption is, is good or bad. And then before I hand over to Mercury, I also want to emphasize here that this, this data that I presented to you right now still refers to the intention. 
So as we know from other examples, other studies, there's always a big gap between the intention and the actual behavior. And this, the, the strength, although there's a positive uh, association, the strength of this association depends a little bit on, on the type of behavior. Uh, so whether whether these results, how strong this will be in, in the field trials, we will have to discover in, in the future. Um, but it will mean that the results will uh, will be slightly different uh, when measured against actual behavior. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank everyone. And then I want to give the floor to Mercury, who will talk to you a little bit more about the clustering of the, of the results. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Peter. Mercury, so I let you then take control of the presentation. OK, thank you, Marie. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Greetings uh, from Athens, Greece. Uh, as we said, as we already mentioned, one of the primary objectives of uh, the project, of the NAS project, is to take advantage of the RITS uh, mediation, the RITS capabilities of digital mediation platforms to deliver, to, to tailor uh, NAS interventions into different groups of energy consumers, taking into account their particular socio-psychological characteristics. Therefore, uh, an important thread in the analysis of survey data relates to the uh, search for uh, distinct energy consumer profiles that are informative about interventions. So that is that they give us some information, some indication as to how to identify energy interventions for each of these uh, classes. So, to make the problem a bit more concrete, uh, we focus and we deal, we work with the 15 uh, socio-psychological constructs, variables that relate to the three models of human behavior as presented by Peter. So these are the constructs that were measured in the third module of the survey. And we come up with a 3,129 times 15 uh, size matrix. Uh, each row of the matrix corresponds to a survey respondent, each column corresponds to a construct, and the values of the matrix are the scores uh, in individual uh, constructs. So they are averages over all items that measured the construct uh, in the survey. Uh, these are the real numbers, essentially between one and five. Individual item scores are integer numbers in the Likert scale. Since we average over uh, items, uh, then more values uh, come up, which are not necessarily integer. And the output, the desired output at least, is some intervention ready, we call them uh, energy profiles classes. So the standard uh, approach to any kind of segmentation study is clustering. Clustering works on objects, in our case, survey respondents which are characterized by a set of features, in our case, the scores in the 15 constructs. And then clustering organizes these objects into groups, clusters, so that objects in the same cluster are similar, more similar with each other in some uh, concrete sense than with objects in, in another cluster. Right? Uh, cluster is a highly automated process. Clustering is a highly automated process. This is an advantage, but on the other hand, it is also highly parameterized, right? So there we can apply different algorithms. There are a bunch of those there. Uh, we can consider different sets of features, the full feature set or 15 variables or a reduced set coming out of feature selection techniques, or even uh, some new kind of feature set that is some weighted combination of the original feature set. This is done with feature transformation techniques. Uh, the algorithms are further parameterized by the actual measure of uh, similarity between the different energy consumers or the number of clusters, which is often uh, an input parameter to the algorithm. So in the next few slides, I'm going to summarize the results of our experimentation with clustering. Here we worked with uh, the K-means uh, algorithm uh, with a Euclidean distance as a measure of similarity. We demanded two clusters out of the algorithm and we applied feature selection that returned us a subset of four features as optimal 
for the clustering task. Yeah, these features uh, correspond to uh, a subset of the constructs of these 15 constructs explained earlier. In this case, it's consequence awareness, environmental concern, ascription responsibility, and personal norms. Uh, this uh, 18 panels summarize the outcome of, uh, of this clustering process. The 15 of these panels correspond to the 15 constructs plus three socio-demographic variables, so it's age, gender, and uh, education degree. If we look at one particular panel, uh, we see three box plots uh, that capture the distribution of user scores in the overall sample. This is the blue box plot. In cluster one, the red uh, box plot, and uh, in cluster two, the green box plot. Box plots, for those that are not familiar with them, uh, there is a line here showing the median of the scores. There is uh, the 25th and the 75th, 75th percentiles of the scores, and also the minimum and the maximum uh, value. It shouldn't take much time to notice that we see that users in cluster two, in the green cluster, let's say it this way, uh, score better in all 15 constructs than users in the red cluster. Right? The only exception is uh, uh, loss comfort loss, loss comfort, which is, uh, however, the semantics of the scores there are the opposite ones. So the lower the score, the better for energy efficiency. So this kind of relationship, we uh, tend to uh, summarize it with this kind of dominance notation. So cluster two somehow dominates. It's actually stochastic dominance, but we don't need to to say more about this at the moment. Cluster 2 dominates cluster 1 in that uh, users, the scores are on average better in all 15 constructs that we uh, start. When we keep everything the same and just change the number of clusters requested by the algorithm, we will still see uh, a cluster which scores best in all 15 constructs, and this is the green one. We still see another cluster, the yellow one, which scores worst in all 15 constructs again. And now the new thing is a, an intermediate cluster, the red cluster, whose users score second uh, in all 15 constructs again. And this is, this is the main remark, quite uh, strong and special. This consistency uh, in the rankings of uh, clusters in all constructs, right? the synchronization. And if we add, if we increase the number of clusters to four, we get a similar thing. Now we have four clusters, the best one, the red one, uh, the worst one, the green one, and now two more clusters, the yellow one, with users scoring consistently the third best score in all 15 constructs, and the purple one, where users score uh, the second best uh, the second best score in all kind of constructs. Yes, that uh, there is a similar thread in uh, with five clusters. So summarizing the results, uh, we can say that clustering yields energy consumer groups with identical score rankings in all uh, fifteen constructs. And this is a very strong kind of safe for the clustering structure, which most importantly is persistent across uh, different options uh, to run the clustering process, right? Uh, it persists uh, under different clustering algorithms. We try a bunch of those, k-means, uh, hierarchical clustering, uh, spectral clustering techniques as well. Uh, we tried with different number of feature sets, the original feature set, a reduced feature set coming out uh, of, from feature selection. Uh, another a new feature set that comes uh, as a weighted combination of the original feature set when applying the principal component analysis. And it persists also when we change the, the measure of similarity of the different energy consumers, whether it is a Euclidean distance, a Manhattan distance, or cosine symbol. Now, the plausible question is, is this a good clustering? And as you guess, the answer is it depends. Depending, actually, it depends on which angle someone approaches. Uh, the question, if we uh, question the clustering fitness, then the answer is that we, it is quite good. Huh? Not excellent, maybe, but quite good. 
the figure here plots the silhouette, the distribution of silhouette indices uh, for all uh, energy consumers. So for a single consumer, the silhouette index varies from minus one to plus one. And the closer it is to plus one, the better the decision to assign the particular energy consumer in that cluster rather than, than any other cluster. So average silhouette scores of in the order of 0 0.35, 0 0.4 point to a quite good clustering a structure. As I said, not an excellent one, but still acceptable. In terms of clustering balance, I think we are fine. So we have a reasonable spread of cluster sizes. There is no giant cluster monopolizing the population. Uh, there, is no, there are no tiny clusters either. So we'll have some minimum uh, size. What's the problem? The problem is that this structure uh, doesn't help us a lot uh, with the task at hand. So the matching of interventions with this energy profile. So the groupings that clustering produces are not really very helpful, very informative about what we want to do. Uh, therefore, we had to think a bit out of the box, as they call it. This is what we have named intervention aware classification. The idea is that we have, uh, we know more or less the set of possible intervention as in interventions at hand that we can use. We have a rough idea of which profiles with which energy consumer classes are amenable to these interventions. So why not directly try to, to look for this particular uh, let's say attractive energy consumer classes into the data. Why don't not just dig the data to search for these specific profiles? And to give just a few examples of such profiles, which we consider that we can uh, properly handle with interventions. One includes what we call environmentally conscious and well-informed energy consumers. So this is a highly ideal uh, energy profile, including users who are concerned about the environment, they possess, possess good knowledge about energy matters, they are aware of the consequences of uh, energy saving, and they feel responsible to act uh, in this context. And of course, they state strong intentions uh, for energy saving, both overall and with respect to heating, which was the main uh, context of the, of the survey. Another example of such classes, which is also uh, amenable to manipulation, to, to treatment with some uh, nudging intervention, is uh, what we call class three, users conserve but lacking awareness, energy consumers. So we talk about, again, energy consumers who are highly concerned, again, about environmental matters, but uh, they have a good understanding of the consequences. They know what this means, but they, there is a barrier. The barrier is the lack of practical knowledge about energy matters and practices that could result in energy saving. So this is a kind of a barrier that can uh, address with an agile intervention, as we will show uh, later. Of course, this description of this specification of uh, energy consumer classes is highly descriptive and qualitative. We need to, to, to get into something more quantitative in order to be able to dig into the data and to find out how much is there for us. Uh, when we consider the range of normalized scores for a specific construct, so when the scores are normalized in the range of 0, 1, there are four intervals of values that have some uh, relevance and some importance for our uh, effort to come with a more formal specification of consumer classes. So there is this green interval, which is uh, right left bounded by the parameter threshold one and includes what we call top scores. So if a, a consumer uh, scores there uh, in this interval we say that he scores very well in the particular construct there is on the other extreme this red interval which is right bounded by parameter threshold four which captures low scores uh, what we call low and there are two more intervals less intuitive uh, with respect to these two the first one the yellow one is right bounded by threshold two 
and contains scores that are clearly worse than what we call top scores. So these are uh, scores that could be improved by some uh, kind of treatment. And there is a third interval, uh, which is left bounded by parameter threshold three, which includes scores that could be termed better than average, right? Not top scores. It may include also top scores, but what this interval is more interested in is capturing better than average scores. Now, how are these intervals relevant to the formal specification of energy consumer classes? What we do essentially is to uh, specify uh, an energy consumer class as a conjunction of conditions on the user scores in uh, certain uh, constants, variables, right? So if you recall the verbal description of the first class, trying to interpret it into a quantitative kind of specification, this is what we would come up. So for a, an energy consumer to be part of this class, he or she would need to, to, to score top at this, in these six different features, constructs, variables, it's, we can interchangeably refer to them. So we want top scores in all these six variables. Likewise, if you recall the verbal description of the third class, what we would like for a user, for an energy consumer to be part of the class, he or she would need to score better than average in consequence awareness, better than average in environmental concern, to have clearly low values in energy awareness. This is the barrier in this certain class. And then uh, a score in uh, overall intentions to save energy that is uh, amenable to improvement. So we work this way with the other four classes, energy consumer classes. In each case, there is some barrier or some facilitator, so some construct where users score a high and implies a barrier or it implies a possibility to deliver some nudging intervention. And this is what, what this is the summary of it. So you see on the left, uh, the six energy consumer classes we have defined. And in the main slide, you see uh, the description, the formal specification in terms of uh, conjunction of these conditions. Eh? So looking at those, you will see that these specifications involve 12 different constructs out of the 15. And of course, they are parameterized by four parameters, eh? threshold one, threshold two, threshold three, and threshold four, which are actually degrees of freedom, which we need to specify and actually optimize. So what we can do is to set up an optimization problem. Constraints in this optimization problem is the order of thresholds. Eh? They have a, a relationship and order. And also from cluster balance point of view, we wouldn't like too big clusters or too small clusters. And the objective of this optimization problem is which one is to maximize the number of users who can be assigned to one or more energy consumer classes. So the number of users who satisfy the requirements as given before of one or more classes, right? Here we cannot take for granted as in clustering that all users will be eventually assigned to a class, right? We, we don't have this view. It's not like clustering will make this a certain. Will anyway produce some partitioning which will contain all users. Here, this is not the case. So what we try to do here is to find those values of these thresholds that will maximize the number of participants that can be classified <clears throat> directly to one or more classes, right? This is an optimization problem. It's a small size problem. So we, we, do a, we did it just a naive exhaustive enumeration of all possible solutions for threshold one, threshold two, threshold three, threshold four. The best solution that emerged prescribes that threshold one should be equal to threshold two and threshold three to threshold four. So we have a kind of a degeneration of the four values into two. Uh, in order to be able to assign, uh, classify 2,132 users. And this is a fraction of the total 3,129 users. 
One thing to note is that not all users are assigned to a single class. So it's about 55% of those who are only uh, who only satisfy the conditions of one class. The rest, the 45% of the users of these 2,132 users, uh, satisfies the conditions of more than one class. And the second thing to note is that there is another almost 1,000 a big sample of energy consumers, which is not, which was not classified directly in this first step of the process. So what are we doing with that one? Uh, well, we assign those users to the closest class. And how do we find the closest class? For each one of the six classes, we compute its centroid. So uh, the averages of scores of the cluster members in all constructs, in particular the constructs that are involved in the specific construct specification. And then we take these 997 energy consumers one by one. We compute how similar they are to the centroids and assign the user to the class with the most similar centroid. When we do this, uh, we come, as, as I said, we come with six classes and the distribution of users into these classes, which uh, ends up in the scores, in the distribution of user scores that is shown in these uh, 15 panels. So one for each uh, construct of the 15 constructs we studied. Uh, one can readily see here, let's say, the ideal cluster with scores top in all 15 constructs. And then the rest, the other five classes, uh, have some barrier or some facilitator that distinguishes them strongly from the other ones, but also paves the way for some nudging intervention. So uh, we could see class number three, for example, the one that we said that energy awareness is a barrier uh, with a distinctly lower score in this particular construct. There is uh, the class number five, which is particular in the, in the sense that these users uh, state that are vulnerable or let's say sensitive to social influence. So we see that they have a quite high value in social norm. This is a facilitator now, not a barrier, a point into certain types of interventions. There are two more classes, class two and four, where the barriers, in the first case, the barrier is high sensitivity to loss of comfort. So we have users that are not much willing to sacrifice their comfort, although overall they are users who want to save energy. With respect to heating, the situation is different just because it implies sacrifice of their comfort. And in the fourth class, the barrier is the lack of a sense of personal responsibility to behave in energy saving way. So these barriers are not readily uh, addressable with some nudging intervention. At least it's, it's not something that comes straightforward out of our head. So what we did, we didn't just stick to the barriers in the specification of the class, but we also added the financial concern. So we demanded that uh, in the definition, in the specification of the classes, that those users should also uh, feature a high financial concern. This, you see it here in the financial concern scores that these two classes score on average always very high in this construct. Why? Because financial concern gives us a hook, a kind of a, uh, a handle to treat with some targeted uh, intervention. Uh, apparently, you can guess how this can, can happen. So just to give an indication of uh, the implication for the intervention mapping, uh, if we look at the first class, the ideal profile, uh, we don't have much to do here. In fact, all we need to do is to maintain their interest in energy saving warm. And this can happen through some uh, regular flow of information about energy saving which can be delivered even with conventional media 
and means, but apparently the digital mediation platforms give us even more flexibility. We need to try a bit harder with the second class, where the barrier is the comfort loss. We said here what we did, we also tried to see the intersection of users who uh, care about loss comfort with those that uh, are also very sensitive about the financial aspects of energy saving. So uh, here, it's the, uh, here we could fit some confronting type of nudging interventions. For example, every time a user might uh, go to change to increase the setting of the thermostat in order to uh, due to to, to save it's the comfortable to, to increase the heating, we could remind him what is the financial implication for the monthly energy bill, right? And this way we will confront uh, his or her action. And then for the third class, the one with uh, the energy awareness, the lack of energy awareness, uh, we have two options. We could either take a facilitating type of uh, intervention. So, make aggressive use of defaults in energy appliances to save the user from delving into uh, the best practices in uh, using the, the appliances, or we could go with the reinforcement type of nudging intervention. So try to use just-in-time prompts and tips to educate the user, to, to learn, to, to teach him what is the best uh, practice at the moment, just at the moment that he uh, interacts with some uh, device. Similar kind of analysis can be done for the other three classes. I cannot just uh, go further on that. Summarizing, we ran some experiments. We experimented with two ways to identify groups of energy consumers that have some information. The one is clustering. In clustering, we start from the groups. Uh, clustering runs in automated way a black box like way and then you have to go into the groups and really uh, search try to analyze to describe them to see how much information is there for the interventions you want to apply the other way around is the what we tried with intervention aware classification there we started with a biased selection of classes so we know which are the classes and the profiles that we know how to uh, treat and we search to see whether the users can be organized into such groups, whether the users really satisfy the requirements of those uh, classes. And in fact, it is the second case that let us go further. Let us really uh, find out interesting, informative classes of energy consumers and do make much easier, facilitate the process of matching energy profiles with proper nudging interventions. So the common thing in these energy consumer classes is that apart from the first one, they share either a barrier or a facilitator for an intervention. Uh, one question is whether this segmentation, whether this grouping generalizes. Uh, for sure, we would like to uh, use the pilot data to try to confirm our hypothesis. More interesting would be uh, the check of the hypothesis over similar surveys. This is not straightforward. Uh, different surveys have made different modeling assumptions. They don't all measure the same constructs, but it is a very interesting exercise to see how we could consolidate their findings and find some uh, solid ways to compare our uh, results. This is it from me. Uh, I think it took a bit more than the other speakers. Apologies for that. The last note is I would like to thank all the people that uh, worked in World Package 1 and World Package 2 of, of NADS, uh, both those mentioned on the slides and those that are not uh, in there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mercuris. Uh, I will go straight away to questions and, yeah, and congratulations to all uh, three of you. Uh, for the presentations, but for the results, it's, it's a very interesting work and uh, yeah, to all who participated. I have two questions already from the participants. That they are mostly addressed to Peter and I think uh, others are coming up. 
So Peter, Mona, Billy is asking on the saving behaviors. Did you ask about past behavior as well? How often did or do you? Or about intentions to behave? Uh, I will already tell you the second one from Carlos Martinez. Did you try a quadrat quadratic <laughs> relationship between income and intent? Uh, yes, thank you, Marin. So uh, to answer the first question, the exact phrasing of, of, of these questions related to saving behavior was how regularly do you perform these activity in your life that take place in the kitchen to save energy? And then there we had the option. So it uh, referred to the regularity of, of this uh, specific saving behavior across these four domains. I hope that answers your question. And then Carlos, uh, yes, in fact, uh, we took a squared uh, uh, income as a, as a predictor for, for intent. And also here, the results are essentially zero. So uh, squared income, uh, so quadratic regression is, uh, doesn't change uh, the impact of, uh, of the intent. But of course, we will never know, but we only have, I think about 1200 people who provided their income. It's always possible that that there's a bias here that people who didn't provide their income do so for specific reasons and that they have a different uh, they have a different um, intention. But it's it's impossible for us to to know this for sure. Uh, I, I do think that given the 1,200 people that did provide it and that we find uh, zero association, that, uh, as I mentioned, if there is an effect for uh, income, it is probably not uh, not very strong. It's impossible to say for sure. I don't know if hopefully that answers Thanks your question. Thanks a lot, Peter. Well, they will tell us uh, if not. We have another question from uh, Chris Mervey. Knowing that classification gives more useful results than clustering, would you now structure the survey differently with other questions or fewer questions in order to assign new respondents to the predefined classes? I, I can reply. Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, regarding the survey, uh, the approach was to, to try to to measure probably a richer subset of variables anyway. We didn't know in the beginning by the time we were planning what would be useful and what not. In practice, we find out that at least for the this classification uh, approach, we used the 12 out of the 15 constructs. So in a way you could call them redundant, but this was only found a priori, a posteriori, sorry. But we are doing now the exercise you imply at the moment. So uh, in the pilots, uh, we want to come up with some pilot specific surveys, and this should last much less in time than uh, this online survey. So we have a constraint of time, and we, the question is which are the most valuable items and constructs to include in those surveys. So we are at the moment we are actually trying to do this exercise. We try to find some rationale to to cut down on items or even eliminate some of the constructs from those questionnaires. So yes, the outcome, what we got, also has some implications for the design phase of, of the survey. I, I hope this answers the question. I mean, you, if not, please feel free to to repeat or contact me. Even I mean email for more details. Thanks, Mercuris. Yes, actually, I didn't say that at the beginning, but we have a Twitter account with a few uh, slides from the event that have been already uh, posted. Uh, we will share the recording and the presentation uh, after the event. Uh, Chris says, great, Mercuris, thank you. So yeah. I think uh, you answered. I don't thank see you. any more questions, which means we would end exactly on time. That's a great, uh, a great thing to do. Could you put the email address of all the speakers? Yes, and uh, we also have actually an email uh, address on the, on the Nudge website, so you can always write there and I will, uh, I'm managing it, so I will redirect the emails, uh, except if they accept <laughs> that we share their email address, I will, uh, I will check that after the event. Uh, thanks a lot to, to the speakers, to the participants. We uh, thank you all because we know it's a very busy time now and we were still, I think, nearly 70 uh, attending this webinar today. So it's uh, it's really cool. Thanks a lot. And uh, yes, then 
stay in touch, register to the newsletter to learn more about what will happen in the next uh, months. And we we will have other webinars like that. So stay in touch. Thank, thank you as well. Thank Bye. you for the attendance. Thank you very much for attending.